Okay, well, welcome. Um, starting out a new semester, new courses. Um, there's some feedback somewhere, but okay. Um, so this course uh, grew out of a conversation set of conversations that I've had with uh, Lynn Holt and uh, about our worrying, I would say, about the decline in trust for trust for government, trust for science, and uh, in particular, uh, the use of science uh, for policy, uh, governmental policies. And uh, this decline has uh, is, is the decline in evidence-based research. Um, and according to a survey from the Pew Research Center, um, 69 in May of 2023, basically now, there are 69% of Americans said they had confidence in scientists to act in the public's best interest. And that is down from 86% uh, who said the same thing, uh, who said that in 2019. So it's been a very deep decline since 2019. And, and this is, a, I think, a matter of a, a lot of, uh, this erosion of trust in science and public policy is a matter of uh, grave concern. So our solution to this was to uh, set up a course uh, Ask, invite a group of interesting speakers to talk about their experiences uh, as scientists uh, in dealing with um, policy, governmental policies, um, and uh, their experiences, um, which they will be uh, sharing with us. Um, their experiences with regulatory agencies and the controversies that are surrounding these uh, these uh, various issues. So. Each of the speakers uh, has a set of issues like vaccinations or whatever, and they um, hopefully um, will be able to address this issue and tell them thus uh, their experiences. But our speaker today, uh, as you will hear, uh, will tell us about how distrust of science is not new. And um, so uh, our speaker is Fred Gregory, he's an emeritus professor from the Department of History uh, at the University of Florida, and his specialty is the history of science. Uh, he uh, holds a BS degree in math from Wheaton College, a Bachelor of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, an MA in the history of science from the University of Wisconsin. We were there at the same time and, and uh, had some of the same experiences along with some others in this room. Um, and uh, he had a PhD, uh, his PhD is in um, history of science from Harvard. He's received grants from the Alexander Humboldt grant from the German government, a fellowship from the Dibner Institute for the history of science at MIT. And he was awarded the 2009 Hayes and Education Prize for Excellence in Education from the History of Science Society. Dr. Gregory's research interests have focused on German science in the 18th and 19th centuries, and uh, his textbook on the natural science in the Western history was published in 2008. So today, uh, Dr. Gregory will speak to us on the uh, science and public trust. Well, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be able to come back. Uh, we, I was here in the fall, and apparently it wasn't a total disaster because you did invite me back. I see a lot of people whom I recognize, and I appreciate your coming out today. So I'm going to be giving the historical, you know, generalized approach to the subject. Um, and that, as someone already just said, yeah, it's not something that's old or that's new. It's something that's pretty old. Now, some folks do trust science implicitly, and some others mock it, as we know. And we'll see more of that. So lack of science or trust in science is not a, a new problem. Up here, yeah, oh, that does make a big difference. <clears throat> yeah, it's not a new problem. Now, I, I, I'm a historian, right? So I, I want to point out that there wasn't 
scientists until the 19th century. That's when the word comes into common parlance. And uh, there was no professionalization or no profession of scientist until really after that. Um, but there was always a long list of people who were interested in nature and how it worked. And the claims that they made back then commanded no social authority at all. In other words, they were curiosities, they were of interest uh, to people, but that's about it. Now, the end of the 16th century, you begin to see some things that are happening that are a little more grabbing. In other words, they were hard to ignore. And uh, <clears throat> I would point out, for example, the supernova in 17, 1572, which for them was a new star in the heavens. And that was visible during the day. And uh, so people could not help but see it. Um, <clears throat> but it was of most interest uh, to the astronomic, astrological significance that it might have held. But there was one guy who saw more there and wondered about it. And this was Tuho Brahe, the Danish astronomer. Um, <clears throat> he wondered if the new star threatened anything commonly understood about the way we see the cosmos. And uh, this is kind of a, 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 a what idealized picture of the way that the world was seen back in the Greek times and really since, certainly right up to Tycho's time. And that is, there was the realm of the heavens, which was the realm of the eternal, and there was the realm of generation and corruption, which was the earth, right? And between the two, there was this no, there was a big gap. But that happened at the orb of the moon. So beyond the moon, you were in the realm of the eternal, no change. And below, you could have change, you could be born, you could die. But there was a standard test that Tuco could use to see which realm a heavenly body occupied, and that was something called parallax. So if you are a person standing at MD and you observe a star, well, observe the moon, you'll see in the background a particular star. You see where the arrow is pointing there. Now, if you're at KS, you could get there by either knowing somebody else who is occupying that position, or you could just wait in our terms now, for the world to turn to that. And that's called diurnal parallax. In other words, as, the, as we think of it, the Earth is rotating. Of course, for them, the Earth was stable. But it's the same thing because the heavens would be turning. So uh, then if you're at KS and you follow the arrow, you, you see in the background of the moon a different star. And that shift between the first background star and the second background star is called parallax. Well. <laughs> If you hold your, your thumb out in front of you, close one eye and close the other, you're changing locations. And you'll see that your thumb shifts or the background shifts, right? And that's, that's because you're in two different locations. So the moon does display parallax. That's, that's one test. So it, it is, of course, at the juncture of the eternal and the generation of corruption realm. So he proved that the new star, in fact, was beyond the moon in the realm of the eternal. And he accomplished that by showing that the new star that he saw did not display parallax. That means that it's farther away than the moon. Okay? So all you got to do is see if something displays parallax. And if it does, then it's relatively close. So if you were to hold your thumb close to your eyes and do that, you'll see it's a much greater shift. If you hold it far away, it's less. And if you go really to the back of the room, you won't see any shift at all in the background. Well, that's what's going on here. The star is not showing any parallactic shift. But that can't be or shouldn't be. The comet of 1577, he also checked for parallax. That didn't display parallax either. And so he knows that the comet is beyond the orb of the moon. The problem was this, all this is for the ancients, was that the realm of the eternal, you're not supposed to have that kind of change. Things don't come to be and go away, which they did. In other words, this 
supernova, as we would now call it, did not stay forever. It appeared suddenly, and then a couple of weeks later, it was gone. And so that's change in the heavens, and that's not supposed to be. Prior to this time, comets, for example, which had been observed but not checked for this, they had been assumed to be um, weather phenomenon. In other words, they're below the orbit of the moon, because that's where you can get change, all right? So Tuco could infer that the distance of both the new star and the comet was uh, greater than the moon's distance. The comets, of course, they go, they come from nowhere and go to nowhere, and so they, they seem to be really odd if they're beyond the orbit of the moon. So uh, while Tuco had this technical understanding of things, most people did not bother with that. They were certainly of interest to the folks, but again, they were interested in it for the astrological significance. Uh, now, when you come a little bit farther down the road in the beginning of the 17th century, uh, Galileo's claims about the motion of the Earth and all of the place of the Earth, that that's a little bit harder to deal with. Um, and it would seem that it would be a little bit more than, you know, of casual interest and maybe just a curiosity. It still was not something that, you know, garnered a great deal of attention because uh, it was just a, obviously against kind of things that you're supposed to. And so the issue was, for most people, was a matter for the church to decide, uh, much like he did with many other things that were controversial because, of course, claims that the earth moved would be controversial. Um, and uh, the natural philosophers, while they did cause a political, I mean, they noticed it, but nevertheless, there was no long-term effects from their curiosity. Um, <clears throat> it's, um, this is where I'm going to show you a little bit about Isaac Newton, who one would think it'd be irreverent to mock uh, we've got a little video here that we're going to try and play that would show you that, in fact, he wasn't beyond being mocked. Yep. Society. England under the Georges was preoccupied with money. These are the years of the South Sea bubble. With politics and with scandal in the coffee houses. Nimble now make art travel for us is all about stories like there's no boundaries, fictitious making memories. Is My so process is the balance of stepping out of the gives us the space and comfort to stay on the go to take it all. in part from spite, and in part for political motives, because Newton was a bigwig in the government establishment. The group of Tories who later helped John Gay to satirize the government in the Beggar's Opera also helped him in 1717 to write a play three hours after marriage. I Traveling love how this car lets me get all of my tunes. This memories. amazing so sound. tell you what happens. There is a play that mocks Newton. And, pardon me? Back to the mic. Yes, thank you. I will forget that. But um, so, yeah, it's a play that mocks Newton for his various uh, alchemical things, not because people didn't believe in alchemy, but it was just a way to mock him and, and in a couple other ways that he mocks him about uh, Newton's discovery. So the point is that as big a a figure as Newton was, he wasn't beyond being taken not seriously. Okay. Am I back there? I think we're back to where we want to be. Yeah, so these are all political uh, developments that the governments and the people in power could, could handle. And that, that remains the case until you get something called the public sphere. Now, 
public sphere is something that was defined and brought to attention in 1962 by Jürgen Habermas, who wrote the book called The Structural Transformation of the Bourgeois Public Sphere. Now, what is a public sphere? It's an arena where citizens come together, exchange opinions regarding public affairs, where they discuss, deliberate, and eventually form a public opinion, all right? But the private sphere is what you do at home in which you don't seem to threaten anybody except the people in your family. Uh, but uh, that was uh, in contrast to the public sphere. Public sphere emerges in the, well, most people would say, the public sphere comes into existence, starts beginning to, in the 17th century, in the English coffee houses. And that's where shopkeepers and merchants and intellectuals and, and protesters of various types, physicians, ministers, all bourgeois people, right? Um, generally, the point uh, is that the discussions were uh, lively. They were frequent. People were able to come together and give their opinions. <clears throat> and this, this then gave rise to a new phenomenon called public opinion, all right? Because there wasn't any public opinion before. And so with the rise of the public sphere, you could no longer just ignore what the public was saying because it became much more important uh, as, well, as middle-class society emerged, of course, with it. Uh, and so this is an insignificant for kings. They couldn't just ignore what people were saying. Now they had to take into account that this is bigger than just the rabble having their say. <clears throat> in France, it took a little bit longer uh, to fit into the 18th century, but it was in place firmly by the end of the century, by the end of the 18th century, that is. And what was discussed in French salons, for example, uh, <clears throat> this one is one example, was frequently public issues that were uh, on, current, on people's minds. Madame Joffrin's salon was probably the most famous Enlightenment salon of the 18th century. There she is. And of course, Voltaire hangs in the background of everything in the intellectual world of 18th century France. Here's a couple other characters in the crowd that I point out to you, Diderot and Rousseau. Uh, <clears throat> and this leads us to common factors that might undermine trust that people have in science. So they can come, what are these factors? They can come from politics, from a threat to free choice, from disagreement among scientists, this was misunderstanding of the nature of science and elsewhere, and they often are interacting with each other. As we consider these things, I'd like you to ask yourself, how many do you think we still have around today? And I'm pretty sure you're going to be able to add to them when I'm done, and I look forward to that discussion. So first, let's look at the understanding of science when it clashes with the dominant religious um, tendencies. Now, the abstract discussions among the English philosophes were sometimes opposed by religious authorities. For example, in Diderot's Encyclopedia, uh, he included works by Baron Dolbach, who was a noted atheist. There weren't a whole lot of atheists around till the late 19th century, but they were already here. And of course, Diderot's encyclopedia ran into trouble with the church, as did Buffon's Histoire Naturelle. In the very first volume, he it runs on his his uh, natural history runs on for many volumes, as you can see there. Uh, in the first volume, he talked about epics of creation in which he was suggesting that the earth was many, many years older than that. Well, Darwin's origin of species had similar problems with religious authorities. And so you can see that uh, this is not new and probably one thing you'd point to first as to why some people might distrust science is against the, what their conception is of things religious. If it, it's also uh, when things are popular 
and uh, they clash there. Now, this is a, the scene of mesmerism. Mesmer was a guy from Austria who was a physician, but he stumbled on his theory of mesmeric fluid. There was a fluid that apparently streams through the body, and when it gets blocked by disease or some other cause, then people get sick. And if you can free up this blockage and let things flow more naturally, you can get well. Now that probably sounds like something else that you can think of. Um, and so um, it was very popular. Public became fascinated with mesmerism at all levels of society. And it was related to hypnotism, obviously. Um, but the established uh, establishment among the science people, the French Academy namely, conducted a test to see if this mesmeric fluid really existed, and they concluded that it didn't. And so this was a blow to Mesmer, who then says, I'm going to appeal to the public, because he knew that the public was enamored of mesmerism. Well, now you've got this opposition, really. And so scientists can lose the confidence of people uh, when they seem to be opposed to something that they find really interesting. So if, it, if an understanding of science clashes with the dominant political uh, sentiment, uh, because as the revolution moved to the left, we're now in the late 18th century, obviously, and when the revolution moved to the left, um, a number of the Mesmer followers um, <clears throat> We were, were converted to the revolutionary fervor. Now, Mesmer himself was not among them, but the Mesmerists were. And there were a number of French revolutionaries, noted uh, French revolutionaries, who were uh, defenders of Mesmer, in particular Jacques Brousseau, Brousseau and others. So when the radicals, that is, uh, when they, revolutionaries, kind of took over and became the new radicalized uh, establishment, well, that's when you find the uh, mesmerism joining forces with a new kind of standard political atmosphere. And so the opposition of natural philosophers to mesmerism made them enemies of the revolution. And so now they've got a problem. The extreme ideology of these revolutionaries was inconsistent with scientific method. That is, as mesmerists became more and more politically radicalized, they joined the radical left. And that does not sit well with the academy. The academy's opposition exposed the radical scientists, uh, I suppose, I'm sorry, scientists who are elite as enemies of the revolution. So a natural philosopher appeared to be threatening the prevailing revolutionary sentiment that they became more vulnerable to the existing authorities. Take the case of Antoine Lavoisier. I imagine a number of you have heard of him. He's a chemist from the 18th century, famous for lots of reasons. But, um, and he was in the academy. Uh, and up to the time when he fell into disfavor, he was happy to help the revolution um, with his need for gunpowder and for weaponry and the introduction of the metric system, all these things were okay, but eventually he was opposed by the revolutionaries and even to the point of execution. So there is a historian named, uh, um, now I'm gonna blank on it, no, Charles Gillespie, who <clears throat> maintains that Lavoisier was not executed because he was a tax farmer, which he was, he had a privileged position in the academy, and then as that he, he was allowed to collect taxes, and he'd keep a portion of them. And uh, of course, that didn't sit well with radicals. And everybody always assumed that his execution was due to that. But Gillespie does not think that's the case. He thinks that because Lavoisier's conception of science, which was much closer to the one that we have today, much more mechanical, much more uh, you know, automatic, was not in, was inconsistent with Mesmer's which was much more romantic, much more organic. And so that was what they set them against Lavoisier. Well, the philosophes assumed, that is the 
uh, intellectuals of the Enlightenment, that the public, which now included the revolutionaries, should accept the authority of the results of the scientists because uh, they were evidence-based and therefore true. But the method of science itself is not democratic. Scientists don't decide their outcomes by their compatibility with prevailing popular ideas. They don't bend to that, yet there is no, there is an implied authority in their conclusions. And so because of that, because there's an implied authority, people are being told what they should do, and they don't like it if it goes against what they consider to be uh, not only logical, but also the case. So this later turns into a kind of common phenomenon. That is, when scientists were uh, required to give in to political pressure. Here's another case, T.D. Lysenko, who's a Russian, and he was part, he was an advisor to the government, of Lenin and others, um, Stalin first, but he was an advisor who well, gave advice on agricultural matters, right? And it, <clears throat> he was also a Lamarckian. Now, a Lamarckian is a person whose understanding of biology is not mechanistic. It is much more um, based on the, the desire of uh, what happens. In other words, let me see if I can get this better. He, he said, Lysenko, along with other Lamarckians, said that it didn't really matter um, <clears throat> what you were born with. That, that doesn't matter, but what matters is what you do, you know, with uh, what your, your traits are. So that um, Darwin later would say, no, it does matter what you were born with, your biological constitution, your heredity, et cetera, determines what's gonna happen over the kind of evolutionary change. The Lamarckians were evolutionaries, they evolutionists. They believed that evolution happened, but they just thought it happened very differently, namely that you acquire the traits that you need and then they are passed on, right? And that's the way evolution proceeds. So uh, this was Tita Lysenko's idea, whereas the, the scientific community in Russia and elsewhere was moving much more into a Darwinian understanding. And as a result of that, um, Lysenko was at odds with the scientific community. The Russian authorities, Stalin in particular, liked Lysenko. They liked what he had to say. And so they backed him and made it very difficult for geneticists, which were coming along, uh, to pursue genetics. And so this, this is another case where political, you know, the the dominant political power is um, getting in the way of doing science. Hitler is guilty of this too. Uh, here's a tirade that he had, uh, <clears throat> in which he said something quite interesting. Our national policies will not be revoked or modified even for scientists if the dismissal of Jewish scientists means that the uh, contemporary German science must be annihilated, then we'll do without science for a few years, right? And he said this, in response to Max Planck, who had asked him to, well, he had tried to petition to get Hitler to stop dismissing scientists on political grounds. Uh, obviously, he wasn't successful in doing that, but that's, the, that's another example. So the public distrust of science often arises when scientific ideas appear to threaten individual freedom of choice. This is, for example, evident in people's contemporary belief about evolution. I bet somebody can tell me who those two people are. Anybody want to take a crack at it? William Jennings Bryan and? No, not Scopes, but yeah. his defendant, Clarence Darrow. Yeah, that's correct. So a lot of people didn't like what evolutionists were claiming. Uh, they didn't want the evolution to be taught in the schools. They thought that if they were, they had lost the ch uh, choice that was theirs to make. And so as a result of that, they didn't want it. They trumped science, if you will. In other words, they're saying, my freedom is more important than your scientific conclusion or your scientific 
uh, understanding. Another one is, of course, the efficacy of vaccines. That is, people who say, I need to be free to make my own decision. I don't, don't believe that vaccines are efficacious, but uh, you're taking away my choice, and so I don't like science, right? Or even masks, right? <clears throat> Well, public trust in science is affected when there's disagreement among scientists. At the end of the 19th century, there was a long debate between the Darwinians and the Lamarckians. I've just remembered, I just mentioned about that. And uh, that went on and on for quite a while. It went up until 1930. And, uh, and the people would think, well, if scientists can't agree, why should I believe them? Or which one should I believe? I mean, one scientist versus another. And uh, there were reputable scientists on both sides of this. And to the extent the public grasped that, they thought that you're undermining the nature of science if you can't agree. Well, last Thursday's Gainesville Sun had the opposing reactions in which the Florida Journal, uh, Surgeon General uh, is trying to say, don't worry about the COVID vaccines. Uh, you don't need them. And most people, of course, have to make up their mind. Do I want to get a shot or don't I? And then they're thinking, well, I got one expert telling me I should and another expert, allegedly, telling that I shouldn't. So you can understand it when people say, I don't really trust the scientists. They can't agree. If there's a misunderstanding about the nature of science, you can have people lose trust in science. What do I mean by that? Well, scientists supposedly are supposed to give us unbiased objective truth, but any clean break between fact and theory is shown to be overly simplistic. And we, I just had a course last fall in which we went into this in considerable detail that fact and theory are not so easy to uh, you know, to they're they're not so easy to just see. Well, this is fact, and that's theory. Theories that sometimes are brought to scientific investigations, so that you might not think of one thing as a fact that somebody else will, because you bring something to your belief. You you bring something to your investigation, your scientific investigation, that uh, affects what can count as fact. I mean, if you even just think of relativity or quantum mechanics. If you don't bring that, you get a different kind of science, or science, I should say. And there's a, an example. Or scientific results are just arbitrary, as in, for example, the claim that evolution is just a theory. Well, that obviously is not co correct for many people, but for others it is, and they think that justifies them. If scientific conclusions aren't simply true, yet are more than just arbitrary, what are they and why should we trust them? That would represent somebody who's actually thought about the matter, but you could see that they might distrust science. Further, scientists change their minds. So how can we trust them? They change their minds on lots of things. Um, we used to think that, now we know. Right? Or who automatically trusts science when there's money to be made by making a scientific endorsement or tests show that? You always got to ask who's, who's claiming it, who funded the survey, or who funded the research. Uh, so you can't just automatically take what you read about science. Or the claims of science sometimes seem preposterous. If you know anything about quantum tun tunneling? or even the expansion theory of cosmologists, you would say, really? You know, you expect me to believe that? And so you sow a certain amount of suspicion. Uh, when the press is misleading, for example, uh, early on it was said that uh, estrogen and is not something you want to deal with in menopause, but now they're qualifying that, say, no, don't worry about that cancer threat. Because if you do it the right way, in other words, science is changing its mind. And uh, that does, and I'm thinking of the, the movie by Woody Allen called Sleeper, in which uh, 
they ask him about his diet, and he gives this diet that we would be comfortable with today in most cases, right? And the one, he's 200 years in the future, and the one guy from the future says to another guy, oh, he comes from back in that era when they used to think deep fat was good, was bad for you. We now know it's good for you, right? So science changes its mind all the time. Even some scientists themselves sometimes express a lack of confidence in science. Now, this chart is about scientists. A little hard to read, so let's just take a close look at it. If you, this is about public confidence in science from the few charitable research over a number of years. You see the years in the bottom, but relatively recently, the late teens and 20s. Uh, and the ones in green, uh, the, the green, let's see, they have a great deal of, no, not too much confidence at all. Now remember, these are scientists. They don't have much confidence at all, up to 23%, down 22%. Or the ones in dark blue, they have a great deal of confidence in science. And the ones in blue have a fair amount. So one might expect from scientists themselves that that would be more that they would trust uh, scientific results. But a corollary of these insights, I think, is that the actual truth or falsity of scientific ideas is not the final arbiter of public trust in science. People don't trust science because they have shown something is true or false. They do so for other reasons as well. And which those are depends on your belief and how you add these factors that I've been talking about up. Now, this is a topic that everybody has an opinion about. And I'm counting on that because I'd like to get some of your thoughts on what is it that causes people not to have trust in science? Um, or should there be some times when you don't trust science? All right, so I'm gonna end there and open it up and uh, just let me know what your thoughts are on that. I'm sure you have some. Great, thank you very much. Some thoughts. Just yesterday, my husband was exclaiming about, he just read an article, um, and I don't remember the statistics, but a high level of statistics of, I think contemporary scientists in academia have been fudging their data. Yeah. And that is very concerning. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that because it's usually from a scientist who's pretty convinced about something, but didn't necessarily get everybody that he was supposed to have gotten or got a few outlying things and said, I can ignore those. You know, somebody who, now that's being generous in saying that, that the, um, the falsity or the misleading part of it, you know, you can understand the motivation why some people might be tempted to, to say, well, I remember when my wife worked at a um, diabetes, under a diabetes research program, she's a dietitian, And they would have to measure protein and things like that in the blood. So a person coming in would have to get a blood test right away. And if it was below a, a certain level that you required to have for something, they would say, well, eat a couple of these. And then, then they would say, we can include you now. <laughs> So that, that kind of a temptation is always there and people are human. So yes, I think that was a good factor. Yeah. Does the level of mistrust somehow depend on how radical a scientific finding is? I, Copernicus was scorned, excommunicated. Uh, Actually, he Copernicus wasn't. Uh, Galileo had a rougher time. Yeah. But um, oh, sure. I'm sure that's right. On the other hand, sometimes sensational things in science end up being part of the contemporary landscape. In other words, people are very interested in things that are somewhat outrageous with the hope that they might become actually accepted. And I think history has shown that that can happen. So, pardon me? Dark matter. Well, yeah, we might catch some people in the room and say, I don't know about that. You know what I mean? So there's room for debate there. Um, I think that 
one of the uh, things that is happening currently is because people in positions that we've respected in the past make statements that are quite counter contrary to good common sense and so they are perplexed um, but if they have any science background i hope that they would understand that <laughs> they're getting a lot of bad information yeah i mean um, science is power is in part due to its self-corrective capacity. In other words, they'll say, well, we did think this, but we can't think that anymore because of the following development, right? So yes, that, that's certainly the case. Uh, Christine had, Jane, I think, Christine. Let me go to Zoom real quick. Blythe, would you yeah. like to unmute and ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I was simply stating that my wariness is with scientists, not with the scientific method, because, for example, if medical research is done on a limited group, such as only young college men, but then extrapolated out and stated as applying to all humans, that is demonstrably incorrect. And in fact, it has harmed uh, women and people who are not, you know, young white college males. Um, that's where my wariness with science comes from. Right. So bad science, I would call that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> bad science can give science a bad name and people have reason to distrust it. It's not clearly always the case that, well, this is obviously what you should think. Christine, do you want to get um, Basically, that question illuminates what I want to say. What exactly do we mean by science and scientists? Who are they? What do they do? What is science? I think uh, without a definition of that, we're sort of arguing in the stratosphere. What we're assuming here is some kind of common understanding about what scientists are. And I, we have a number of scientists in the audience, so I could stall with Paul. Do you have any thoughts on a definition of science? Hypothesis driven about evidence-based? Yeah. Um, Self-corrective. Yeah, there was a question over here. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, is sponsored research through grants or contracts a problem in academic research today? And if so, how serious a problem? All right, Which, what is it you said? Re sponsored. Presumably, uh, re Research, but, but maybe research. paid for by uh, something other than NIH and NSF. Yeah. Okay. Like, sure. By yeah, companies. I mean, that, I don't know how to assess how how much it is, but I would say that if the research is funded by uh, a corporation, you always have to ask yourself, what's their interest in this? You know. Uh, on the other hand, it catches you and you're caught in a bind. For example, it was a case right after World War II, that 80% of the funded funds for research in lots of ways were funded by the Defense Department. Now that's, that's also colors things. So we don't live in a vacuum. We don't live in a perfect world. Uh, and that means that even though you might think that scientists or science is one of the best ways to approach, and I do think that, but it's not immune from these kind of distortions. So it's prudent on everybody to have a certain degree of skepticism about most things. But on the other hand, if it's the best we've got, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, Shirley. Uh, hello, hello, Fred. I'm up here in the Zoom uh, box. Shirley. Uh, I think we're about to enter a new era of research with all of the data that's being collected People are staying awake at night, figuring how to apply some research question to the amount of data that is available because the race for money in this sphere is very large. Yes, that's called big science, right? <laughs> how do you do it? Um, we, yeah. We're certainly entering that phase and uh, I, I don't have any you know, wisdom for you on that. Um, I'm a little worried about just turning it over to AI um, and I suspect you are from the 
Snickers. Uh, but there are no doubt people who are trying to write algorithms that will cover contingent cases in a way that's responsible. Uh, I think that the biggest problem that we need to face is an awareness of what these problems might be. Uh, and so, yes, that's that's we have so much data out there. Uh, I don't know how to answer that. There's also a question on Zoom. Uh, how do it's from Neil? Neil, do you want to unmute and ask yours? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, my question concerns the the whole issue of disinformation and the uh, spread of social media in terms of moving information around and distorting things with different information bubbles and the implications with artificial intelligence using all of that misinformation and coming up with really distorted and uh, uh, problematic positions. Exactly right. I mean, I, I knew you guys were going to come up with new ones that I hadn't thought about, but that's really a good one um, because we've seen that this, or at least I suspect, and I think it's pretty much common knowledge, that in the past elections, we've had to wonder about whether, whether the social media has been a major factor in the outcome. So, Jim? Well, I, th I think today we have an increase because of what we can do with media today we can make things appear more or less the way we want them to appear and so the ability to separate reality from bullshit is now increasingly difficult and you and i think we we have to try to figure out and realize that there are, there are really complex problems and trying to figure out the answer to something that may be being affected by two dozen things and we're testing two or three of the things that might be influencing this, we can, we can get misled with the best efforts we make. Science investigating what's causing what can be very complex and difficult. And if, when we don't realize that, we can be fooled by things that don't even begin to get to the real truth of something. Well, that, that's a very good point, and I think we've made it in several forms here, but I think it's a really good point, especially given the press's role. Now, I'm going to bash journalists a bit because sometimes they need a story and they need a simple story. They don't want to have one that's not going to be read or I, you have to be corrected on that. I was talking about that with my family and I said, well, that won't sell newspapers. And she said, you mean that won't make people click <laughs> because she works remotely for Wired Magazine and her interest is in getting you to click, right? So, but the same issue, right? Um, you're not gonna click on if you're not grabbed by something. And you just got done saying, but you can't get grabbed by one thing, it's complex, and it is. Now, my question, and I'd love to hear your views on this, how much of this confusion that's caused by that image of science that is not complex is due to scientists themselves? Anybody wanna take a crack at that? I just um, just wanted to add that uh, this whole issue isn't new. I mean, there's lying with statistics mm -hmm. is a <laughs> is something. I mean, yeah, that's long something admired. That's long admired, right? <laughs> I think maybe one of the things also is when new findings come out, how it kind of turns things around a bit, and this makes people will wonder, what do you believe? like going back to Lamarck versus uh, inheritance just strictly through genes, now they know through epigenetics that the expression of those genes can be changed when a woman is pregnant, experiences trauma, or even without being pregnant. This changes her genes. That's passed on to her offspring. 
and the, her offspring's genes are, are th those same changes are passed on to their offspring. And this can go on for generations. So now um, inheritance does, you know, gives a little more credence to Lamarck. Not, you know, not like you can cut off a rat's tail and it'll be passed on, but uh, makes you wonder. I can, I can hear the, or I can see the newspaper article now. Uh, Darwin shown to be wrong. Jane, there's a couple more here. Scientific investi investigations are expensive. Do you think that limits what can be investigated? Probably, probably, um, because society then has to make a decision. Do we want to fund those? Do we want to have the super colliders funded and take away money from other things? You know, that, that's a huge amount of money that's required for that kind of stuff. And um, is it worth it? Is the space program worth it? Worth it? You hear this kind of question all the time. So yes, the, the answer is yes. The amount of money that's required for research is going to affect whether or not what you're doing is believable. Okay, and also on uh, Zoom, is, is that Phyllis, Sarah, is Phyllis? How to address the underlying problem of poor science education programs in K through 12 and individuals uh, state control of what is taught in schools. People don't understand the scientific method, including teachers. Well, mm, I, a lot of teachers know perfectly well, but yeah, that certainly could be a problem. Sure, sure it could. And uh, one of our last, our last speaker is from the School of Education and he will be talking about that very issue. True, anybody else have any? Yeah, Paul, no. No. No, we need to magnify your voice. So can we look at different societies um, and address issues such as the rights of the individual versus the rights of society as to what is acceptable in terms of, is that too diffuse a question? No, in fact, I would want to actually turn that question back to you. How would you answer that? He's in a position to answer it much better than most of us. Ah, well, we all play to our bias, which is the first thing to say. Um, and my comment here relates to the fact that the Constitution within the United States and the rights of the individual seem to be stronger than, let's say, Europe in general, where the rights of society seem to predominate. And I think that within my own area, which is a vaccination, may be a, an important factor. But I'm not a social scientist. I'm not a philosopher. And perhaps the likes of you would have a wiser perspective on that. Oh, big mistake. <laughs> No, I, I think you're, the, that kind of a factor is obviously involved because you can go to extreme cases like, uh, well, the American freedom of the individual as opposed to somebody who lives in a society even which is totalitarian, let's say. That's the other extreme. That, that is definitely going to have an impact on what you think of science and how. You know, for example, the Russian case of Lysenko. Uh, you know, that that was directed by that factor. And that's kind of the harsh attitude to take. You could be much more uh, friendly and say, people who see the world differently from you, they might have ideas that would truly be of, of use, but they don't get a chance because you dismiss their worldview. You know, that that's another way of looking at it. So they're not trying to do anything to suppress truth. They're just trying to do it the way they believe. You know, if, if you think it's the scientific theory is more attractive because it is, quote, beautiful or it has an aesthetic component to it. Certainly Einstein felt that way about his theory, that it was a beautiful thing. You know, and so if that's your goal, to find something that resonates in a harmonious fashion, which a lot of science does, then you might come down differently on something. So, yeah, that factors in there, too. I think we're uncovering yes. the fact that this is a big, difficult problem. Just, just one point that, uh, that I wanted to make. Uh, I saw something in the paper today that big oil is spending eight figures on ads to convince us that big oil is helping 
climate change abate. And uh, you can just believe that a lot of people are going to believe those glossy ads. Yep, that's again, it's what you come down on adding all these things up, how you add them up is going to really be what your response is to this. Anybody what? else have anything? Oh, yeah. okay. It's silly. I just have to say that's the best pronunciation of the word bullshit I ever heard. <laughs> James is uh, notorious for that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say he's an expert. Okay. Well, um, I think we'll call that an end here. Uh, thank you very much for all your input. And um, next week we will have um, Sam Wisely from the uh, uh, Department of Wildlife Ecology talking about um, her dealing with uh, some wildlife management issues which have been extremely controversial. So uh, that another, Topic. Thank you very much, Fred. That was a great introduction.